Oh, right, okay. He's up to no good. Yeah, he's, he's, he's up to no good. Um, now, I'm just going to pop out for a second, and I want some discussion in, discuss, discussion in the background. And um, these, these are uh, microliths, um, and these could be used for almost anything. And they're about so long, some, sometimes I length of my little finger. Um, and I want all of you, by the time I get in, which is going to be in about 30 seconds, come up with an idea what these things could have been used for. And we're looking at about um, 8,000 years ago, and I'm going to be picking on Natalie straight away. Or Nicola. Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing there, you know, using the loo, and there was this guy behind me fiddling around with the sink, chatting away. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. thinking there's something not quite right here. Right, so anyway. <laughs> we um, were told earlier to use the ladies. They're working out there. Oh, <laughs> Christ. <laughs> well, uh, uh, right, so any, na Natalie, go on. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, you, yes, that could be. I, I like the pressing in for one bit. Well, that's used. Now, Goff, what about you? Not crackers. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, Dennis. I like that one. You doing that one? No, pick me your nose. <laughs> you I actually, yeah, cool. It's Michelle's like always size. complaining, so yeah, I pluck my hairs. <laughs> um what about you, young man? On the sphere shelf. In the living room, so there's a nice shelf dedicated to you. So so you should have a, a length of wood and you'd have them inserted, yeah? Yeah, fine. I like that one. And uh, Chris. Like the board to drag across yeah, the field, yeah, yeah. otherwise known as not threshing. Um, I like to be corrected like that. Now, this this wonderful this wonderful area we're going to look at today, and I do apologise for being yeah, we was meant to start at um, quarter past, but I'm ten minutes later today because I genuinely did get up ten minutes later. Yeah, but we had, we'd already started at. We'd already started at 26 when Steve came in. That's when we officially start. Um, anyway, I do apologise, but we'll, 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 get, we'll get our thingies with. But anyway, to, to these, these wonderful um, artefacts um, and everything that we've said, uh, and without that woman with blonde hair being mentioned or red hair, because she's got really she's got a wig, really, Alice Roberts. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, you mean you've been watching it? You wouldn't have known otherwise, would you? <laughs> no, I, I, no, genuinely, I haven't been watching it. But I watched that episode of the de de Detectorists, um, and you were you were dead right. It did really upset me when I watched the third episode of the Detectorists. Um, and yes, everything that they're portraying in the Detectorists at this minute does go on in archaeology. I have been told to keep things quiet on development works, and uh, I've refused to do so. Um, the end results are not getting paid, but that's something else. Um, but anyway, looking at these, these microliths themselves come into a period when things are smaller, everything's smaller. The animal, the, the quarry that they're, they're hunting is smaller um, rather than big beasts before. So 12,000, 14,000 years ago, big beasts like mammoths and oryx and all the rest of it require big weapons, um, big, um, uh, big scraping tools for big skins and hides and all the rest of it. Later on, everything that you've said is, is really right. 
but also you've got the idea of harrowing as well, agriculture. So small is good, isn't it, Goff? Um, so there you go. That's what Alan told me anyway. <laughs> right, this, this is a big collection of, of microliths, various flints, and chert, and chalcedony, and other materials that have been used um, for hunting, agriculture, decorative purposes, uh, you name it, it's there. Um, and there's, there's the term of Swiss army knife used today. Uh, the multiple purpose flint, which everyone should have, Keith, Goff. I have a Swiss army knife. Anymore. Yes. <laughs> have you got a multiple purpose flint? Right, don't get it out. We don't need you to brag. Um, look, looking at this collection straight away, um, you've got these used for hunting. Um, you might have, um, actually, these are practically all used for hunting. You may have one or two scraping tools, scraping tool there. Uh, you might have one or two for decorative purposes, um, but as you can see, the scale. Look at look at the scale there. One centimeter. That's hardly a centimeter in length. But each of these uh, wonderful artifacts from eight thousand years ago um, has been napped. Okay, each of them has a sharp edge to it. Now, Keith. Well, I'm not going to do this demonstration, Keith, because I will be arrested, right? But if I put my hand in your pocket and you had a flint, right, I would cut myself. You would. Yes? Um, where our Swiss Army knife is nicely folded up. It is. Job done. If the flint was wrapped in a bit of leather, though. Oh, yeah, it would be fine. Yeah. But the point, the point being with all of this is that you've got a, you've got a fairly new flint. Um, and you've got a fairly old flint. The two differences between these old two flints, one. if you... What? Old new one. And, oh. um, the f difference between yours is even your, though yours is really sharp, if you um, went like that, you'd have... You'd be able to slice your flesh with it, okay? But if you went like that with yours, you'd need to go to A&E. Because um, over time... Over that very sharp edge, a patina builds. It's so so minute, but that patina is going to create that sense of resistance for something that's old. So that's a really important point. So now you can work out that yours is a fake Venice as ever, as it would be, and yours is the genuine article, because you only go with the genuine. Yes, I worked you out in the back of the car the other day. Um, this itself... Um, could be used for a number of different reasons, um, but it's only, as you can see by scale, this itself um, is just over uh, six centimeters in length. Okay, so that's what you've got. This could be used for scraping because it's it's only it's only about that big, but it might be used as a miniature adze. It might be used as decor decorative. It might actually be the byproduct. Uh, of a flake that's been extensively mapped on the outside and then the byproduct um, and this discarded. Um, you, you, not necessarily do we know that they've always been used. Oh, when an archaeologist finds a flint, wow, it's been used by an ancient ancestor, but not necessarily. Uh, just because it looks interesting and old, it doesn't mean to say um, it's been by, used by an ancient ancestor. Um, and the other thing as well is, um, an idea on dates. If you find something like this in the ground, how do you know it's old? Um, because these can be created today. Um, however, however, if you get a large collection of them in the field, and um, they all look like those previous microliths and look like these, they're probably all from the Mesolithic period. Two important points here. Uh, the first important point, point to use is we've now got microscopes. Let's go on to another slide. We've now got microscopes. And occasionally, um, in these, in the sharp edge, you can find organic materials, such as wood. You might be able to find um, remains of sinews, all these different things. Some fragments have been used, so found, so you can actually find what they've been used for and how they've been mounted as well. So this, if this has been uh, mounted um, into um, a spear, um, some kind of a shaft, you might find little bits of wood indented um, into 
um, the flint itself or chewed. Now we've got to go back a minute because what we've just looked at, and I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not digging myself out of a hole when I say this is a, this is chewed. Um, for a time, this is where it gets confusing. Everything from everything found like this was referred to as flint, but it, it's not. It's actually chewed. Um, so you can get away with picking something out, out of the ground like this and say, wow, this is flint, but in fact it's chewed. There's two different materials. Chewed, basically, you can't see through it. Okay? Can't see through it. Um, you can't see through chewed, but you can see, if you put flint up to the light, you can actually see light through it. That's the difference. One's, one's fairly um, translucent rather than transparent, and then the other you can't see jack anything through it at all. Uh, now, you're looking at something here. Um, that's sort of a bit like a Swiss Army knife. Um, you might use that as a cutting edge, and you might use that as a scraping edge. Um, there, is, there is one really interesting point, um, and the interesting point's going to come up, and it, and it involves fairies, um, and it involves um, something else really important. Now, we do find lots of these um, where you get Mesolithic sites from 8,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. You find lots of these around Mesolithic sites. Uh, I've got, I got the pleasure to have excavated one site that we sort of found out that was Mesolithic, and as we started to find out it was Mesolithic, we had to put a stop on the excavation. But um, we, we, um, and that's in the Vale of Morgan. Um, and you start to see these wonderful things. Um, but these wonderful things, uh, some of these might be used for hunting, some of them might be discarded, um, some of them may not look perfect. Dennis, remind me of fairies and ornateness in a second. Um, but let's talk about, let's talk about skill base. Let's talk about skill base. And this is a really interesting um, analogy. Uh, let's get something... Oh God, we don't look at my will and testament. Um, right, look at this. Look at this. Um, we're not doing fairies at minute, Dennis, so don't worry. Um, looking at this. Now, a skilled napper, that's church, but forget it. Um, whatever, whatever, they, whatever they're creating, whether it's out of flint, church, chalcedony, or whatever, um, this, is, this could be an experienced napper. Um, and an experienced napper, we do find their sites. So what you do, you find a load of debitage, a load of waste, uh, waste bits of nap flint. And where you find a big pile of um, little chips and whatever of nap flint, it means that the person working, whatever they were working at that point, they were working shirt, um, all, the, all the tools that they produced were actually used in hunting, agriculture and so on. But then you go a little bit down, down the road, a bit of an apprentice. We've actually found a site like this, which I'm describing. You go another pile, the apprentice pile. And in that apprentice pile, you get little bits of nap chert, okay? Little bits of waste product, that debutage as we call it, little bits of waste product. But there's one or two final products that in fact, in fact just didn't get there. They napped off the end of the flint. So it's just, oh, for God's sake, I hope you didn't notice that. Yeah, I saw that, and that would be just chucked away. Okay, that would just be chucked away. But they nearly got there, the apprentice. So that's the next pile. She hasn't got to the, the full the full tradesman yet, but it's getting there. And then you get the novice pile. We've found one side like this, you get a novice pile. And you get loads of bits of uh, tools that look like they more or less got there, but they've really screwed up, and you get mulled ones, and you get so much waste. And you can tell that the novice has done that. So we've got one site where we've got a novice pile, um, and then we've got the apprentice pile, and we've got full sort of um, artesian craftsman pile. And, and we do find that in our, in, on our cosmic sites. We found one site and similar other instances which are like that. So what, what we actually what we're actually looking at here, um, in between there, because if you pounded this with a big pebble. Um, it would do a lot of damage. So what you've got to do, you've got to, you've got to get the nodule of flint. Uh, this is how you can demonstrate it with a mobile phone. You can get a bit of nodule of a flint, okay? Um, and there, there you go. You've got this in your lap like this. Um, and you get something softer, um, like a bit of antler. And you put it in a little bit of a fault. 
you get a bit of poundstone, and that's it. You get your 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 um your, your tool that you can use. Okay, and then what you get then, um, you sort of gently on your knee, you press it, and you um here you go, keep pressing, pressing, and that's how you get your fine edge. Okay, you work it along the edge, and those little flakes actually create the edge and then you turn it around and you do this and that's usually with a bit of antler if you did that with a bit of a stone you wouldn't get far, far. and that's that's what we're talking about uh, that's a skill uh, that's a skilled artesian so if we go back to these again what's that artesian artisan I thought artesian was um, plural. No. So it's artisan. Yeah. My God, I need to, I need to redo oh, my degree. Because um, it did say... Oh, my, it, my, the, 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 the Max came back and said, this is a wonderful piece about Wales. <laughs> I wondered why that was. So, oh my God, why didn't you say that in a couple of seconds ago? You lot are really frustrating. I just You did. Oh God! Oh. It's not good. Anyway, yeah. I mean, I've got the sniffles already. Right, this itself is actually um, what's this material? Can anyone tell me, flint or chip? Chip. Yeah. You are completely correct. So when you're going across a field, Chris, um, in the summer, <laughs> with hardly a stitch of clothing on. <laughs> oh, it's gonna get worse. You bend over. And you pick a piece of flint up, and all those wonderful men around you, they say, can you do that more often? Oh, anyway, this is a bit of truth. Ah, uh, Lynn's missing all this today, isn't she? Um, and as we know, this is, um, uh, this is an ant, um, and this is, um, this is one of the wonderful early forms of your plough set equipment, and you're ploughing the landscape. Um, and this again is made of chert. So, you know, we've got lots of examples of these things, but just because they look like tools doesn't mean to say that they are. Always remember that. Not everything that you find in the ground was what it was meant to have been used for. Um, archaeologists have wonderful imaginations. This is chalcedony. So, you do find occasional worked um, uh, piece, pieces of lithics. Um, that's what the family is, all stone lithics. And that's chalcedonium, so you can find a beautiful head. The difference with chalcedonium, flint, and chert is it's not a real great material to be used um, as um, arrowheads. It might be used fairly good as a scraping tool, but the edge seems to go quickly. And what um, chalcedonium really is like, if you ever get pearl soap um, and you chuck the, the pearl soap in the bath for a while, the pearl soap gets loads of little lines down it and it starts to go a bit fuzzy and all the rest of it. That's what Chalcedoni is like. Uh, that's, a, that's a good um, metaphor. For it. Um, ch ch Chalcedoni is formed in sort of similar situations to Chert, but we've got the direct description of that, which we'll go on to. Um, now, um, what we're going to do, I think... Oh, right, yes. Where's, where's the image that I want to go on? I need to get rid of those ones. Right, okay, so here we go. So we're not going to get there yet. So we're not. You don't come in yet, Dennis. So there you go. Um, bit of a toolkit there. Um, that that may have be, that may have, that may be held like that. Okay. It's um, it's a thumb scraper, as we call a thumb scraper. Um, that that's going to be used for hunting. Um, that may be used for scraping again. That's flint and that's chert. Moving on. Um, right. Um, top marks, which is the which is the Paleolithic, um, which is the Paleolithic of these two, and uh, which is the Mesolithic. One's from twelve thousand years ago, fourteen thousand years ago, and the other's from eight thousand years ago. Which is which, Kathy? That's correct. And this is the Paleolithic. That's for hunting big beasts. Um, this is oh. Top max, um, for, for a full house, Natalie, what would this have been used for hunting? You can concur with Peter. Well, they still use a fish. 
Well done, Natalie. Uh, you get to have a glass of wine with Peter as well. Peter, Keith, right. exactly. Uh, well then, so this itself, you, you can imagine uh, the way this works is is, is quite ingenious. Um, so you, you've got the old salmon there, a big beast there, and you've got gut bang in there, right? And as you're pulling it out like this, saying, look at what I've got, slithering around, the, the salmon... Um, can't get back off because it's it's held in with these two teeth into its flesh. It can't get back out. Okay, so you can have it writhing and wriggling. It's not in any pain. Um, there you go. The government says that all animals don't feel pain. There you go. And it's writhing. So this is quite ingenious. Formally, you can imagine goths out there. Go on, goth. Go for it. Go on, goth. Bang. You don't have these two. And goth, as he as goth starts to um, extract the fish out of the water, the fish just slithers away. So, Goff, I'm going to go with you next time. No tea time. <laughs> I'm not going, yeah, oh, really? I've got tea with you. Oh, yeah. um, so, that's exactly what's going on. But I, I was looking at this thinking, actually, um, this is a really good design, uh, but if you've got a really um, muscly salmon, um, these two teeth are going to break every time. Because they're, they're really fine slithers. Or maybe I'm underestimating the strength. But but when you're when you're taking the, when you're taking out of the salmon, it's going to rip all the flesh as well. Uh, but that's exactly what this is for. A great big salmon. Um, and what what it is, you've got this slightly hafted. So you've got two bits of wood around the flint there, holding the flint in. It's glued in. And then um, you've got two other bits of wood coming out here. And you're wrapping it all around. Um, if you're in the United States, you might be using a bit of tar. Here, you might be using um, beeswax, and you might be using um, uh, you might be using um, pine. pine. That's what I was looking for, pine resin. And, and as it goes high, so this is exactly what we're looking at here, um, pine sap. Uh, again, this is a big block of chert. Let's move on. I don't want to just do another chert example. Um, and this, there's a point I want to get to, Chalcedony again, um, and these these wonderful objects. Now these are not the creme de la creme because the creme de la creme, if my slides hadn't moved around because it's um, yeah they do. Can you look at that there? Look at these beautiful things. So we're gonna we're gonna do my point now, okay? Um, and the point is this. You don't find as many of these uh, wonderful, um, you can see that the skill, when you look at these, they, they are perfectly symmetrical. They are beautiful um, artifacts. Uh, they're napped on either side. Um, they've got equal proportions. They look absolutely beautiful. And the way these would have been um, hafted, as you say, it would be bound around. Um, but you don't find as many of these. Um, and the reason is as follows. You can imagine uh, that, you're, that you're a master craftsman um, and it would be far easier to knock a load of these off in, in the sake of an hour or so. But even if you're a master craftsman, each of these little nicks has to be put in by hand. Um, they're, well, I can't count them, uh, but there's about 50 to 60 nicks along there, either side, there, there, there. You've got to knack this surface. And you can imagine, this is going to take time, whoever you are. So if, say, for example, something like this takes, I don't know, two hours, the other collection there, you do 20 in an hour, and you're going to use the other ones for hunting, and you might use these for something else. Because you can imagine... Um, if you're spending a large amount of your energy producing these wonderful shaped objects, mm -hmm. and then you go out hunting, and the 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 first uh, the first pull back of the um, arrow, okay, uh, and it shoots up into the air and it misses the game, you've lost that forever. So that time is wasted. So you can imagine you you spent uh, you spent the best good hours of daylight producing these, for example. Let's forget about that. These, for example, 
and the next day you fire off all these and you don't get a bird, you don't feed yourself. So it's more likely that you're going to have a toolkit that isn't as good like that and you're going to use these for hunting. That's the point. Um, just go back a little bit and then... Da, da, da. I need to get rid of it. Uh, more for ploughing. Um, this, this again, um, when they found this, this had a razor edge. Okay, this is a knife, um, and that is a complete tool because it's got a razor edge. Somebody created that edge um, with, with, to, to cut whatever. Um, but you might find that in the ground. The thing, it's not, it's not the complete project, but it is. That's the knife. Um, we saw this last week. The ads. The, the, the plow ads as you as you drag it through the ground and you can see that that skin there uh, of the flint module um, and you've got that little bit of a head that would have been dragged through the ground um, and that's what you're using to crudely plow your landscape when I say crudely plow we've already had this discussion uh, a little slit across this really rich, rich landscape would give you a bountiful crop we've already done that um, again this is um, this is interesting um, um, would this have been used for ploughing? Would this have been used for cutting down a tree? Or would this be known as a platform, the core and what's left? And I would say that this is the core and what's left, and this is what would have been discarded. Um, if I, usually an archaeologist finds these things, oh wow, we're going to use this to cut down a tree, right? It doesn't really have a great edge around it. Um, and this is from the Mesolithic period, you don't need these big things. And lots of these were just being discarded when they've got the best um, of, of the bits of flint or chert off to be used as arrowheads, to be used um, in harrowing, for example, and so on and so on. You might discard something like this. Um, I, I, I know this bloke, right? As You know that bloke as well, don't you, Keith? Um, I know this bloke who used to live down in Fleet, down in Hampshire. And there was a group of archaeologists they were excavating. Um, and they were excavating in a quarry bed. Um, a Mesolithic site, and they come across buckets and buckets of these, and and they took um, the the napped uh, chert and the napped flints away, and they left all these behind, these platforms, uh, because simply um, this was the byproduct and not the be all and end all. That's the point. More of these, um, and uh, just an interesting thing before I go on to some of my uh, interesting texts, which I'm going to go on to in a in a short while. Uh, this is um, this is from a collection of somebody who used to um, be a guitarist in the Rolling Stones, Bill Wyman. He, he's actually got quite a big collection of um, Paleolithic artifacts, and obviously another um, ads there. Um, more of these. Um, you can imagine that that's a really nice edge. I want to get away from these now. Um, these very fine microliths. That one's um, smaller. Um, than the end of your finger. That's really, really small. You're talking about uh, five, five, six millimeters in length. But that would have been used for something. Um, and today, um, it was unfortunate when, when I when I first delivered this on Tuesday. Uh, one of the guys who comes along to my Tuesday class in the evening uh, via Skype, um, his 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 um, granddaughter is is having um, eye surgery. She's only about. Um, six years old. She's lost one eye due to cancer, and the other one they've got no eye surgery. Uh, I, I thought this is not appropriate to say this, but I will. Um, today, it's preferred that in medical surgery involving your eyes, um, when you've got to try and do something with your eyeball, you actually use flint blades rather than stainless steel, because a flint blade gives a finer cut than stainless steel, and that's fact. They're using flint today. Is that, is that so, the irony of that is, is that we've moved on to computers and we're using technology that our ancestors used. Um, may, we don't know if they did eye surgery in the past, but, but they used these fine blades for something. Must have been for cutting flesh for something. Um, and that's really interesting that we're using this today. We're going into um, using this past, past technology um, to have a practical use today, which I think is great. Um, I don't know who mentioned this earlier on, but let's enlarge on this. Um, and the, the piece that I've got about um, harpoons, um, I felt was, was rather fascinating. It's, um, so we'll go on to that. Now, you can imagine, um, 
I, I have I have always wondered about um, the top one and how it works um, because you can imagine that you've got this edge here um, and you're using it as a harpoon and you've got a blunt end and how is this being used we're we're not going to talk about that now we're going to come on to that uh, but this reconstruction here um, has a wonderful length with a tip and you can see these sharp microliths placed into this um, into this um, harpoon uh, sometimes in bone sometimes into wood but these are mounted in place using glue um, or as we joked, epoxy resin 8,000 years ago, which was not around back then. But obviously, we've got the different glues. Um, pine resin would have been one of them back in the past. And even boiling down bones gives a good glue. And even, you know, we, went, we looked at einkorn last week and different uses for einkorn, and maybe it wasn't always used for, for bread. Um, um, flour makes a good glue, if any of you mucked around. I, I used to use flour when I was a child to glue bits of paper together. When my mother was a visiting nurse, so she used to go around to the houses and all the wallpaper was glued on with flour and water glue and cockroaches love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. You could see the wallpaper moving in the houses. <laughs> <laughs> but when we have another trip for archaeology coming, I'm going to make sure I avoid that one. Mind you, we have stayed in some strange places, haven't we, Kathy? You remember that place in Norfolk? No, we, we don't remember. No, no, that's enough. Um, obviously, the toolkit there again, that was very strange. Um, and obviously, back to this wonderful collection. Um, now, we're, we're, we're back to this final slide, and we'll go on to my notes then. And... I, I have I have found I have found something very similar to this, um, but unfortunately, as we were excavating at the end of the excavation, uh, we were just clearing the ground. Um, somebody put a mattock through the end of it. Other than that, it was perfectly fine. Um, you know, when anyone was working with me on an article, because we've got this obsession that I sift everything and we go through everything. But this was an area that we were just coming to the end. Found a beautiful thing like this. It was beautifully napped around the edge, and you looked at it, and it was absolutely beautiful. Um, um, and you just start to think, oh, maybe, maybe I'm completely wrong with this. Maybe, uh, maybe they were able to produce these things a lot quicker than we can ever imagine. And maybe they were used for, for hunting. Maybe they were used for precision. Maybe the people with the bow and arrow used to get their quarry every single time. I don't know. But we don't get as many of these. But, Dennis, what did I remind, remind you to say? That's it, fairies. Well done, Dennis. You're good at remembering things. Um, fairies, fairies, fairies. Now, um, you can imagine, right? Natalie, there's me, there's you. We've got 20 children behind us. All your, all yours, all mine. And Kathy, you're in on this one. We're wandering along, and suddenly we stop, okay? We're all ignorant and arrogant, okay? And we pick up one of these, and I go, children. Look at this, and it's only that that long, and and one of Kathy's grandchildren comes forward and says, actually, that was used by a fairy. That's proof that fairies exist, um, because that would have been used by a fairy to hunt, because they're very very small, and as we know, Natalie, fairies are very very small people, um, and in fact. I haven't just made that up at all. In the medieval period, uh, particularly around Norfolk, uh, the idea of fairies existing um, was enhanced and enforced by these being found because they were so small. Um, it was believed that the only people that could have ever made these was the fairy folk. Um, and some people still believe it today because we're, we're, we're struggling to try and work out how they, how they were able to do these wonderful things. And some are really, really small. Um, again, more there, um, and you can imagine this is the ba basic hunting toolkit. You can imagine that that's hafted in there, hafted in there. They're actually quite good edges if you if you sort of half them. That that might be used um, to um, to wound an animal. 
to sort of wound, sort of wound its flesh rather than to kill it outright. The animal that you'd used, you'd use that for was something like a deer. So it would bang into the flesh um, and another wind there and you'd gradually follow it. And here we get a bit gruesome. As it's in its last moments, you grab it by the neck and you slit its throat and the blood pours out and that can be used for so many processes. And it's still done today uh, by people hunting elk um, in North America and Russia. You see programs on it. And as the animal still breathing as you're doing this, uh, you've got all the sinews that you can cut and everything else. But then again, you ask forgiveness from the deer or elk for taking its life as it's suffering. But then again, that's, that's what you would use this for. You don't want the animal to die out like, right, because if it if it died out right there and then, you might it, it might be dragged away by a wolf. You've got to be able to follow it. Okay. That's what this is for. And actually, something very similar. You'll know this, Dennis. Um, uh, Dennis Keith. Uh, you'll know this, Keith. Uh, in the in the period uh, in in the um, medieval period when they were finding these things, um, as naval supremacy started to build. So in the late 1400s. They were trying to work out how to how to um, disable a ship's rigging. Okay, so you you can't have somebody with a tiny with a rope like that. You can't have somebody sort of with a bow and arrow trying to hit that rope. It's not going to work. But if you've got an edge like that, it's more likely going to hit the rope. It's going to cut through the rig rigging. And they made these instead of arrow flints, arrow iron instead. So they were learning from prior technologies. And to be honest with you, this shape really never changed. Um, and even in the American Civil War, um, um, the, the Confederacy and the Union American Civil War uh, had Native American detachments and they would be used, they would use um, uh, arrowheads very similar to this to take out officers. Um, and they would be very quiet. Nobody would hear a gun go off and that technology was still being used. Um, and there you go. The, these, the, this is something that we're going to do at the end today. Um, I'm just going to double check something. We've got a few there. Good. We don't want to do that. Uh, you, you can imagine. Um, uh, you, you've got an enclosed canoe there, um, and you've got this harpoon, um, and you've got all these barbs on the end. This is an illustration from, I don't know, uh, 80 years ago. No, that's not a shark, it's the back of the canoe. That's a person. Or a bag. Or you might have a statue of Lloyd George. We don't know. There you go. You can see the face of the individual as well. With a cagoule on. And these are wonderful things indeed. These are really wonderful. And there's an illustration, right? The way archaeologists get things wrong is unbelievable. There's an illustration of, um, of these being found in Ireland. I think I've still got it on yet. Um, and the archaeologist doing the reconstruction, re reconstructed drawing, um, somebody holding um, a, a wooden shaft and then one of these mounted, cut out of bone in the end of the shaft, but the archaeologists have done it the wrong way round. So in other words, um, they've done it so that these hit the fish, fit into it, um, and the fish can easily ride out of it. And in fact, it should have been the other way around. So what would have happened is these would have been, um, there you go, that's better. They, these would have been mounted in a shaft and would have been bound on. Uh, and we do find these in places like Doggerland. We do find one or two of these in the Irish Sea as well. We've already done all that. Um, and the whole point of this is that the, um, the seal, uh, or more likely the fish, can't sort of ride away. Um, you're going to be able to drag it towards um, uh, the, the, the boat that you're using. You're going to be able to drag it back to shore. Uh, there's going to be a, a rope a, a tied to the end of the shaft. Typical harpoon 
uh, mentality. Um, and these barbs are meant to keep on the end whatever's on there. In fact, more or less, this is this is um, a cruder form or more advanced form of a fishing hook. Not these are examples that were found in uh, Dogland. Um, lots of these were destroyed by the Luftwaffe in 1941 when they bombed Hull Museum from Norway. Uh, we had a large collection of these in the Hull Museum, which have been dragged up by dredgers, um, but some do survive. Um, and these themselves don't need the mounted flints. This have just been finely carved out of one piece of antler or a piece of bone. So this is that wonderful technology that's been dredging up. And there you go. This is obviously rolled around in the sea, really water-worn. You can see the little <coughs> nicks there that have been tied in, tied onto the shaft. Uh, and there's more of them there. So what I want us to do is, uh, I've got, we've, we've had enough of the images now, haven't we, Natalie? Before Natalie falls asleep. Um, I'm still awake. What's that? I'm still awake. <laughs> right, well, it, 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 it's, 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 um, uh, yeah, it's good. Right, so there you go. Um, no, it's just pick on Natalie Day today, if you haven't noticed. Because last week it was Peter and Gillian. No wonder she's not here today, because she's scared of me. Oh no, Gillian, Gillian's got her own things to do. Um, so when when we think um, of all this material from the past um, and where it is, lots of it is displayed in museums, lots of it in private collections. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, there's such a large collection of these from around the world. We, we think we know how lots of them were used. Evidence of spears has been found um, throughout the ages. Um, and however, many of these early spears um, were fire hardened wooden shafts that had been sharpened at one end. Now, when you think about that, that's, that's another concept. Instead of using uh, the tip itself to be flint or chert or to be nicely carved, you'd fire harden it. So you'd just have a piece of wood which was being fire hardened. Now, we've, we've got evidence of that. And that's another technology altogether, the idea of fire hardening wood to make it last longer. Um, you know, on archaeological sites, when it comes to settlements, whole timbers are fire hardened. Um, so they so they weather longer um, in the peaty um, and clayey conditions of our landscape. So they don't instantly rot away. So that, that fire hardening technology um, is to do with lots of things. The stone tip piers uh, arriving in the Paleolithic period and the first pier heads uh, were basically those big cores, um, as we've seen already, where you've got a big piece of flint or chert, uh, chert and what's happened, the byproduct has just been discarded and the core itself is being used as the hunting head, as we've already said. Um, but very much later, the way these are being mounted um, with pine resin glue mixed with beeswax, then uh, bound tightly with strong plant fibres or, or sinews, and nothing was wasted. Um, and then we look at the idea that um, they're using a wide range of materials. Um, you know, we, we've come a long way when we're fire hardening wood and then mounting a piece of flint, and now uh, we're using lots of materials, and they become extremely ornate. Um, rarely do any of these um, complete examples survive. Some have been um, dragged up from Dogland itself, um, and there are there is evidence of glue with some of the examples that we've been finding. Um, we do miss when we're looking at hunting other important details. Um, we can be completely obsessed um, with the detail of hunting with harpoons. We can be obsessed with hunting animals with um, big spears, or we can be obsessed with plowing, but there are other technologies such as fishing traps which is also something else that we're going to look into today. Now, what I want to do is so we can get this out of the way. 
Uh, we've more or less explained what uh, flint is, but then again we haven't because uh, we don't really um, know as much about flint um, as archaeologists think they know, but we're going to do that after the break. What is chert? Now, I've already explained the chert itself um, is a stony-like material. Chert is a fine-grained sedimentary rock. So in other words, it's been, it's been formed. It's sedimentary rock. And in chert, the reason why you can't see through it is usually chert itself is full of many uh, microfossils. It can come in many shapes and forms. And in fact, when anyone turns around and says to me, chert should be a white colour and flint should be a black colour, in fact, all these materials can be a huge range of different colours. Um, flint, you can get brown flint. Um, chert, you can get brown chert. You can get grey flint. You can get grey chert. You can get white flint. You can get grey chert and so on and so on. They're the full range of colours. And the colours themselves give a certain sense of uh, magicness to them, which is a word I've just made up. Um, chert occurs as nodules um, in limestones, chalks, um, and it's, it's a replacement mineral. And in other words, as, as what, you've, what you've got in rock, uh, you might have an organic, um, you might have a, um, a soft creature. And as that soft creature deteriorates in the muds and the sands and whatever, uh, that is replaced by a mineral. And those minerals themselves create the final product as chert. Now, what gets confusing is that about 50 years ago, if you found a bit of chert, somebody would say that was flint. Um, so it gets very confusing, but in a completely different material. Um, chert occ occurs in many, many different places, and it's more available than flint. And then we mention chalcedony. Now, chalcedony is a very, very interesting one. Chalcedony itself, um, the main elements of chalcedony are silica, uh, and it's, it's, it's sort of layered. Um, if any of you have worked with asbestos, uh, at school as we did, asbestos samples, where it was Barry Bones, um, what it is, you've got a crystalline structure. It, it, it's almost as if it's layered. It's chemical based um, and it's semi transparent, but chalcedony has got a waxy luster. That's why I compared it with something like pearls, soap. Um, you can assume another, a wide range of colors. Um, mm -hmm. And chalcedony does come from a Latin term, um, chalcedonus, and the name appears uh, written by the likes of Pliny the Elder. Um, that refers to it as a precious ancient gem, but that can be used in exactly the same way as chert or flint, but doesn't last as long. So all that said, we're going to start off with articles of the week after the break. Are there any questions, Dennis? I know you've been wanting to say something, Dennis. Go on, go for it. It's your opportunity. <laughs> That's it. Uh, any other questions? Right. And it's, and it's my go to, to pick on you. I totally did warn you, Dennis. Um, right, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll have a break, um, and uh, that's it. And there's the milk, by the way. Oh, there's the milk. Yeah. Oh, well done. Should I put the kettle on? That's a bottle of water. Yeah, we'll put the kettle on. Polly will put the kettle on. No, Polly put the kettle on. Polly put the kettle on, and God is great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, um, by the way, uh, we might be starting to uh, um, do, um, what was it? I'm trying to get the word out now, it's your point, Keith. We might be actually starting to do development work soon as well, Archaeology Cymru, um, a bit of, and uh, more about that next year. So I don't know why I put that in there, but you know, you might be able to see uh, work in action. Um, in the when when sites are being developed, we might be taking on some of that work again, as I used to do in the. Kathy does. Kathy does. 
and, 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 <laughs> so, <laughs> did you? Oh, wow. And all the manpower services schemes and stuff, yes, all that? Good. So, what I'm going to do now, this is. I, I know it's 40 years ago. Um, Right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to just going to, going to go through a quick checklist of what archaeologists think of different things. Um, and then, obviously, we, we've got that wonderful piece about the harpoon. We've got a wonderful piece about um, Ireland, and then we'll call it a day. So um, whenever you find these tools um, across this wonderful landscape from the Mesolithic period, it's in the Mesolithic period that we actually we are slowly starting to understand how, how things um, occurred. Um, and we're, we're starting to get a feel um, by looking at these axes, by looking at these various tools, by, by looking at these various ornaments or whatever they are created out of lithics, flint and shirt and chalcedony, um, to give you a good impression of what they were creating, what they were doing with the landscape. Obviously, the ads is an example um, that are actually plowing the landscape. And you might have... Um, a, a tranchet adds, which was used for um, hollowing wood. You might actually uh, not get the canoe, but a tree trunk is actually being hollowed out so that these people could navigate the landscape. Back then, the landscape was a lot better um, for people that went canoeing because you had the links with Doggerland. Uh, there were really nice um, um, channels with um, water flowing out to open sea and all the rest of it. They were really nice narrow channels perfect for a wooden canoe so even if we don't get the evidence for the the canoe itself or the boats we do actually get the tools that they used um so just just a little bit of a checklist a bit of a quick one that there um might might have been an ads either for plowing um unlikely to be used for cutting into wood lots of these artifacts are from places like hampshire um, and in fact, the old list, the old list here dates everything from about 8,000 years ago. But you notice the skin there. You don't need to um, nap the skin um, simply because um, the skin itself is is to be covered up anyway. Okay, to be hafted. So basically, to half something, uh, you, my my arm is a piece of wood. You basically slit the end, halved it. Uh, you bind it. And that's your plow. Um, and may, maybe the idea for plowing the landscape came from that very idea where somebody's trying to uh, dig a little channel and they say, if you do it with a bit of wood, you can get in a bit deeper. And that, that's simple, that. It's easy as that. And then again, you don't need large tracts of landscape to be plowed because you've got very small populations. Uh, this again is referred to um, as an ads, and as we get form. We get shears and we get flints. Lots of these to get through. So anyway, I'm going to sit this one out. Um, here we go, scrapers. Um, it says about scrapers themselves, um, the scrapers um, for um, processing hides, for scraping all the blubber and everything off the hides and getting all the hair off as well, um, for other utilities. Um, and also some of these... Not these ones in particular, but some of them you might be able to um, sort of hold there. Um, it's, it's, it's a knuckle uh, flint where you actually scrape down um, either in bone or wood. Um, and, you know, we get lots of these in archaeology. I, I, I found one or two of them. Uh, various scrapers, you can see that one edge there, that's clearly used as a scraper. Um, again, two different materials. Actually, the right, they're both... They, they look to me that they're both chert, actually. Um, that there um, is flint, um, and that there, I do believe, is flint as well. So we've got the two examples. These are really crude forms, but oh, oh, again, scrapers. Um, and here we go. Uh, this, is, this is interesting, where they use the wood retouched. Um, what you do find is that, say you've got, not, not in this example, very bad example, but, um, oh, there we go. We've got one underneath, actually. What we've got there, we've got this was once used as an arrowhead, but whenever that hit the surface, it broke. So instead of discarding that, they used it as a scraper. So in other words, it's been retouched, it's been reused, it's been recycled. Um, and to be honest with you, let, let's let's chuck this in as well. Um, 
when when you think about flint, flint itself um, is indestructible, um, and you can keep using it as long as you keep on napping that edge. You can keep it sharp. Whereas if you've got um, and actually some of them are heat treated as well to give you a bit more of a stronger edge. But that's that's a really precise science. Um, they, these are far more superior to copper tools later on because one blow with a copper tool, you've got to sharpen it straight away. One blow with something like this, as long as long as long it, as it hasn't mucked up the edge too much, you can use it again. So you can keep blowing into a tree, for example. Um, but cutting down a tree with an axe is not the only way to sort of fell a tree. Um, so there we go. The, these are all these. Let's uh, not bore you to death with too many images. Again, we touched multi-purpose tools. Keith, Swiss Army life out your pocket now. Seriously, have you got one? Ooh, look at this now. Look at this. We're going to have big boy thing now, right? Oh, yeah, we'll go with yours is tiny. I know, I know. I've got the man size. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm glad Jane is in here because she would just go off on a tangent. Um, but anyway, that, that... <laughs> the multi. This is known as the Swiss Army knife of the Mesolithic. The multi-purpose Mesolithic flake tool. The oh. curved edge. Oh, this has got pathetic now. <laughs> what is that used for again? You can stifle a pig as much as you like, Michael. Can we just get on with the pot? Exactly. Can we get on? Um, you're not going to come up with something new, Dennis. Good. The curved, the curved long edge on the one on the left and the one on the right itself, um, obviously being retouched. You can see a break on the one in the, on the right there. Um, that might, that might be. Um, it says retouched as a uh, as a spoke save for for planning arrows um, or spears. So if we go if we go with my interpretation of that, uh, that that end might be used um, for sharpening wooden spears. That might be used for hafting. You might tap into a bit of wood. That might be used for cutting. Uh, that flat edge there for honing skin. Okay, so we got at least three or four uses. And in fact, that little sharp end there might be used for making a little hole in a piece of leather. As you sort of, um, so you know, you've got multiple purposes with this tool. Um, and um, as I am used to shaving my legs to play these roles that I play, um, that might be useful to shave your legs. Okay? And it's particularly good when you're on set and a woman's shaving your legs. I really like that. It's when they ask about under your armpits, I start to get a bit worried. Um, Mesolithic flake uh, with platform. And you can see that, you know, you can use these as an hole to make a hole in a piece of leather. Um, so various uses. Um, and, you know, we, we go through all these Mesolithic blades. Look at that one there. Look at that one there. That that is very very sharp indeed. Uh, that's what you're going to be used for um, shaving your legs, Keith. I know you're really familiar with shaving your legs. Um, or having a good old shave around here, as you can tell. I've had a good, not a good. I, but yeah, my because the thing is, I I usually use um, somebody buys me a, a shaver at Christmas, right? And I use it for the whole year. Uh, as you can tell at this stage, it's got really blunt. Um, I'm not spending 20 quid on blades, you've got to be joking. Um, but this itself, I could have probably used this all year round as well as cutting myself because these are really, really sharp. I have seen an archaeologist take one of these out of the ground, right, and literally gone like that and they've needed medical assistance. Um, very silly. Um, so there you go. Um, again, more of these blades and cores, these being used quickly uh, maybe for the this is this is what's left over 
may be used for banging a peg in the ground, may be used uh, for, um, I don't know, breaking open nuts, may be used for various purposes. The more shaped ones for cutting down the tree, I can't really see these being used for much. Um, and these very fine microliths, look at these really fine microliths, particularly the nice shaped one there. Uh, these are mounted, as we said. Some of these are actually quite big as microliths, about three centimeters in length. Um, burins, um, you know, you could think of a burin itself uh, for various different purposes, um, scoring or making holes in something, leather and so on. Um, and if we go down quickly, I want to go moving away. Um, thumb, so thumb scrapers, that, that's what I was talking about. Let's get in there, a nice bit of a thumb scraper. You can see that, and you can get left and right, right versions. Um, and talking about left and right versions, that's another story for next week, Keith, so ask me then. Um, th this, is when, uh, this is when knives themselves are backed, so there's a different texture to one side as there is to the other texture. For whatever for whatever reasons, flake tools. There you go. They go on and go on. So all these different forms, all from the Mesolithic period. Don't do any more of these because I'm very wary of time. And Natalie's going to go on today and say I look slide after slide of these <laughs> bloody flints and chirts, and I'm really angry with it. Um, <laughs> to, but whatever you do, make sure you put Doggerland as one word. <laughs> There was another point there, yeah. but you know, um, yeah, but you wouldn't know about those things, would you? No, I just called you to be fancy up. Like Dennis, there you go. You can make, you can see that as being used to create a little bit of a hole. Um, and if we, so th those are known as micro burins. It's a nice one from uh, the old Wikipedia there. Um, and what are, and you can see the size of very small micro with microliths there, um, one one centimeter in length, sort of and a half um, a centimeter wide. This this type of technology has been found all the way across the world, from Australia, North Africa, um, um, even up until about three thousand years ago. And in fact, they did where they weren't using this technology, um, and they just said, right, we come into the Bronze Age, we'll stop using them. In fact, um, you know, the form and shape of these things um, is being used into the medieval period. Um, and why stop using a very sharp edge when you can um, when you can use it? Because these are really effective and we're using flints today. Uh, this this um, I think it's in here. Oh, that's that's what we're going to look at um, basically next. Uh, we're going to look at um, a piece of bone. Uh, a piece of wood and these have been mounted in there um so what we're going to do we're going to go to that nice little piece it's a love it's a really nice little piece um and we've got to do that as well oh my god i'm panicking uh right so here we go um i like like this piece because we can go we can click on that image and show you what we're talking about uh, it's in september um 1931 a barbed uh, which means it's a, a piece of wood or a piece of um, bone um, has been nicked along it. We'll talk about that. Barbed, made of red deer antler, was dredged up by a trawler on the Lemma and Oa bank in the North Sea. So this is nearly 100 years ago. This object was found um, within a block of peat and was in almost perfect condition. Although long believed to be Mesolithic, it was believed to be a lot earlier. So these things were being used a lot earlier than we give it credit for. Um, and actually, you know, I said earlier on that we got a, a piece of wood or a piece of bone and only along one edge do you see there's nicks along it or barbs. That's explained now. That's why. Because um, they're, they're being used. So in other words... Uh, you've got a big fish there. Instead of having that complicated one where you've got this and they, they match in on the side, uh, you're simply uh, piercing whatever beast uh, and um, without the animal dragging away, uh, if you manage to hit some bone, um, this is clamping onto the bone and you'd be being able to get the fish out. 
um, or a much bigger um, animal, maybe um, a very small um, a dolphin um, or even a seal. Uh, so this is what we're talking about. And here is a little mix where it's been tied. As I say, there are many dozens of these in the whole museum until the Luftwaffe bombed it in the Second World War. If only I could have told the Anna Nerbe, the German wing, the archaeological wing of the SS, they wouldn't have bombed the whole museum. But unfortunately, we lost a lot of material like this. But this actually survives. Uh, you can, and, and it, it took them a while to work out how this was being used. Initially, they thought this, this was being mounted. Um, and then somebody said, well, actually, what about the other edge? Oh, it don't matter, you know. And then by looking at Inuits who, who used um, a, a dual prong, then they worked out that this is how this worked, by, by inferring that evidence. Um, so here we go. Um, so it's, it's really early. So these date from um, 13,000 years ago. I discovered in a lump of peat. It's amazing that somebody... Um, managed to find something in, in a lump of peat about that length. Um, naturally, if you've got a fisherman, you're really busy, and the last thing you want is big lumps of peat on your deck. The first thing you want to do is get them off. right? So I don't know why they they looked in this lump of peat and, then, and they found this, but they did. Usually these things would be chucked away, and in 1932, um, this, this item itself was thought to be maybe Mesolithic or Neolithic in date, but now radiocarbon dating, we know it's much earlier. The harpoon was described as having been found halfway between two boys, uh, approximately 20 fathoms in depth. And I've been told that a fathom, one fathom is six foot. So that's, um, that's 40 meters in depth. So this is where the original land surface was. And you can correct me on that, but that's what I'm told. So 40 meters down in the peat, people used to live. In the in the sea, can you imagine that they get this big chunk and they're thinking, hang on a minute, people, this is in the 1930s. People used to live down there, obviously when there was no water. So that in itself, um, it was found within a large mass of bog moor log, um, a large mass of moor log, which is not wood itself. It's a back, it's black wood and peat all put together. Um, that's sort of like decaying matter, and a harpoon was found. Although no samples um, were retained of the pe uh, peat um, in which the harpoon was found, a number of samples were subsequently dredged up elsewhere. Pollen samples um, showing that the landscape of Dogland was mixed woodland as we know. Uh, this harpoon um, was described and, and figured, and it's an important item. In 1988, the harpoon was sampled for radiocarbon uh, dating. Um, given a date um, some in, in excess of 12,000 years ago, maybe, which puts it in the Paleolithic period, um, revising earlier dates, which put it in the Mesolithic period. So that's a wonderful artifact. Mm -hmm. And next thing I want to show you, that's at the end, because that leads us on to next week. Um, and if I <clears throat> can find, uh, I do believe that the piece on Ireland, I've lost it. So... Um, fortunately, I can't find it. The Peace on Island was um, the piece. Uh, we're going to me mention this as well. This is something that's just come up um, um, on the internet. Um, um, in Ireland, um, I wanted to show you that really wrong image that the barbs are reversed and the archaeologists got it completely wrong. But you can imagine what that looks like. Uh, they're, they're finding similar items in that Irish um, sea landscape, which I wish somebody would come up with a name for it. Because it's really odd saying in the Irish Sea, um, you've got this landscape. They're finding exactly the thing, same things on the east coast of Britain as they find on the west coast. So they're hunting and there's the rich landscape there. So um, just uh, last but one point, really. Um, I know this is ob obvious, but archaeologists um, are now starting to link um, changes in what's going on in the landscape with cereals and animals uh, with obviously human populations. The relationship between human populations and, um, are directly linked with uh, rises and falls um, in, the, in the availability of food, which is obvious, but we've got to scientifically test that. Um, and this is an article that's uh, just been published, uh, which is out there on the internet. Uh, and it's a nice little piece uh, but we've got to scientifically test these things, and yeah, it's right. 
um, that um, as there's more availability, population soars, and as 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 there's less avail availability, uh, population crashes. Why? And that, that sounds obvious, but it's not, because today we can keep our populations going up and up. We've got food stores, you know, we can keep people going. Okay, uh, we can um, manufacture foods that are artificially uh, manufactured. We can have collapses. Uh, in foods out in the environment, but we can keep human populations going. In the past, we weren't able to do that. So we're scientifically testing those things. So um, one last point is, is this. That. I love it. And we're going to mention a little bit about this next week. Next week, we're going to really, um, we're going to in start introducing the Neolithic period next week, but we're, we're going to um, sort of um, conclude um, on this Mesolithic period. And this is actually um, a bit of an article of the week. Um, so, actually, I've got something. Comp yes, here we go. Um, it basically mentions about the open landscape, uh, and it mentions um, about forests and woodlands, hunting and fishing. Evidence for hunting often survives in the archaeological record. Animal bones are found on a number of Mesolithic sites. But more common are the flint and antler tools used to hunt and process the prey. So that's what we're talking about. We're finding the evidence of the activities and not the activities themselves, but sometimes finding the activities. As well as providing meat. You can't think of animals just to provide meat. You've got to think of the carcasses being used um, for fur, the hide and sinews for clothing, antler and bone for tools, and bladders and stomachs for containers. Everything's used. Um, as we know, um, they used to use the various guts of pig um, to be used um, to make sausages. And why not? Um, but that's what you use your pen knife for. I, I no doubt realise that. Yeah, exactly. I know you going off in your blooming Land Rover waiting on the edge of a wood, stalking a deer. Yes. Mesolithic hunters must have an encyclopedic knowledge of animals their behavior and seasons and habits. There, there is evidence from the, um, the paleo-environmental uh, record uh, of selective burning of woodlands and so on uh, to attract animals to come in like deer. And I've actually got an image here that um, is actually really wrong. A coastal li winkles, limpets, whelks, crabs uh, would have been available from local um, coastal sources. And as anyone knows with a crab, if you smash a crab open, it's all jelly-like, okay? But if you heat up a crab, you have that wonderful flesh, um, which isn't as obvious as it sounds. They must have learned that. Uh, let's chuck a crab um, alive into a, a, a vat of boiling hot water and see what happens. And you've got that wonderful flesh. Mm. Seal colonies, linking in with that image last week, may also have been exploited for their blubber and skins. And just thinking as well, just think of this introduction. Uh, you've got um, um, a spinal bone, a big spinal bone, a big lumbar bone of a whale, and, and it's naturally hollowed, right? So if you put up a bit of oil in there, right, um, and you can light it, you've got a lantern. And that's what we're seeing some of these things being used for. And then the uh, bone itself being set alight. But you, you see this being used. So they were using oils to light their homes. Oil, 10,000 years ago, to light their homes. Amazing, right? Uh, we're living in hovels in North Wales um, in uh, eight, uh, 80 years ago uh, with no form of lighting. Um, there you go, Cathy. Isn't that right? Good. Um, seal colonies may also... Uh, there we go. It is quite possible that hunters took to the sea and rivers in skin boats and hollow boats. Uh, hardly full. Hardly poor. Uh, the foot of an auric being found from... Um, uh, 800 years ago. What's wrong with that image, other than everything? Yeah, I, I know, I know. Barbs. Dippy, look. The, the barbs are the wrong way. This has been done by a professional archaeologist. What, the archaeologist or the hunter? Or both? <laughs> or maybe, maybe that's as it got really cold, that's as he was left. Um, the sea, uh, and this last one here today, this, um, we're going to finish on this. The Seton Karoo fish trap. 
In 1984, severe weather led to the exposure um, of a section of wattle panel on the beach at Seton Carew. The panel was at least three and a half meters in length. So it basically um, from here all the way to the end of the room. Um, and the panel itself was radiocarbon dated to about 6,000 years ago, which is basically at the end of the Mesolithic period. Uh, it would have been about a, a, a meter in height um, with 25 surviving sails. So those sails, those panels are um, in amongst uprights. The panels uh, was mainly woven in, in hazel uh, with the sails projecting beyond the weave on one edge only, suggesting that these were embedded in the ground to hold the panel in an upright position. It's just basically making the sim similar panels that I make um, and, you know, typical wattle panels. Um, the panel is thought to relate to fishing activity and would be used to trap fish for funneling them along a channel into a basket or net. Slightly earlier fish traps of similar design are known from the Netherlands and Denmark, placing the Seton example fir firmly in the Mesolithic tradition. So that itself has survived um, all those many thousands of years. And to be honest with you, um, if you compare that with the ones that I create, the way that I do them is exactly the same as that. So you have about you have about five uprights uh, in a, in a block, or you you can do them in clay, and you can interweave usually about the length of a piece of hazel, um, and that's what we're talking about. But this is this is from there to there, so it's incredibly they they, they managed to get an incredible um, strength into it. So you've got that really long length. Um, so that there is what I produce today without referring to that. Fascinating. So we're doing a bit of that next week. Um, are there any questions? As Kathy says, I, I've got to write your names into the raffle book. Any questions? No. I get it from the second chapter of the now we're devoting to the slot. That's going to be hard work. I can't afford that one to work for the one to use slaves. Eating slaves, is it not? You just like the idea of butch slaves, don't you? No. I do. And you seem to think you seem you seem to be bought into this myth that slaves are always the most effective people to do anything. Uh, as the Germans learnt that uh, one in two V two rockets, which went which actually went up, exploded on the ground because the slave labour that was used, you would urinate on the circuits meaning that they would be put out of use. So slaves are one of the best things to use. But, answer back there, if you're going to use slaves, you use somebody who's already been enslaved. A monk is a, a perfect slave because a monk is used to being a slave of the abbot who will do exactly what you tell them to do. So if we're going to use slaves, let's just use monks. Let's not use a normal vulgaris like Keith. Uh, gather word with you, Natalie and Kathy. Are there any questions? Have you all enjoyed? No. Shh. Have you all enjoyed today other than Keith? No. <laughs> I know it was gone because he's been a right rebel. Rick is going to have a right shout at me when he goes he's out now. Rebel. I've been picking on him too much today. I'm glad you've all enjoyed today. Um, see you all next week. Um, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, buddy. You silly man. <laughs> Certainly not. Um...